Welcome to the Biblical Bonitarian channel. My name is Mario, and we have something different for you in store today. We will be reviewing a debate that we have on the channel, the John chapter 14 to chapter 17 debate that we did last year with Brother Martin. We will be conducting a review of that debate. It has been very popular and we received quite a bit of feedback, a number of views, and rightfully so. It is a very important section of scripture, especially as it relates to Bonitarianism versus Trinitarianism. However, I'm pretty confident that most of you who looked at that debate have noticed that the quality of it is not great. In fact, we had a number of technical issues. We even had some issues just on the time, the duration of the debate being so long, especially because we were attempting to get as much of the material uh, recorded. And it just really is not the greatest. And so I've always wondered, what could I do in, you know, short of redoing the entire debate? What could I do to provide you with some content and discussion relative to that? And what I've come up, come to the conclusion on is what we can do is basically take that debate and divide it into the key sections and do a separate video on each one of these key sections and have me provide commentary and insight on each part. Now, I'll be focusing largely on my presentation, but if there's interest, then I can obviously do the same with Brother Martin's uh, section. However, I want to just focus first on my presentation and hopefully uh, give you some background on each one of those key sections. I'm estimating that this will be at least eight videos that allow us to go through all the main sections of the debate. Some sections I'll be skipping because they, they were clear enough. And what I'll also be looking for from you is just in the comments, put questions that you have uh, relative to this debate or relative to any topics that we're discussing on the Biblical Bonitarian channel. Also suggestions, if you have any suggestions for videos or improvements or content that we can do, well, you know, we welcome it all. We understand that we are in a, in a growth stage where we're attempting to expand the reach of this channel. And so we really need your feedback. And so if you haven't subscribed, please also subscribe. But if you've never left a comment or a question, feel free to do so and we'll engage with you. What I would like to say at the outset is that as we go through, this will be very informal. So I'll be stopping and pausing the video. Also, the audio may not be great since I'm taking the audio from the debate and playing it through on this uh, particular recording. So if the audio is not that great, we're not using our normal setup. Uh, so take that for what it is, but hopefully it'll be clear enough where you can hear everything that's being discussed, okay? So with all of that said, I would like to begin with a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, we come before you just so thankful and so grateful for your grace to us in Christ Jesus. It's a privilege to have your word open before us and to be discussing these matters, to have a heart and the desire to do so, not just for debate purposes, but in order that we may rightly understand your truth, that we may have a right relationship with you through your son, the Lord Jesus Christ. And I pray, O oh Father, that you would illumine our hearts and our minds, that you would teach us for those that are watching immediately, or even those that may watch later, I pray that you would bless each person according to their individual needs. For those that are outside of Christ, I pray you would convict them, O oh God, that they may come to see the glory of Christ and they may be convicted of sin, righteousness, and judgment, as it says in John chapter 16. But also pray, O oh Father, that you would also, those that are in Christ, that you would let these truths fall on us fresh. Give us new minds and new, new hearts that we may hear your word afresh. And I pray, O oh God, you would lead us into the truth. Father, I thank you for this, and I pray that it may be done in accordance with your will. And we ask it in the name of Jesus Christ with thanksgiving. Amen. So first up, what I'll be doing is I'm actually going to begin with just some overview in this particular video of the debate and just lay just some of the groundwork. What I'll also be doing is I'll be showing the slides. Uh, that was one of the headaches that I had is that the slides, especially during my section, were not being shown full screen. So you actually see those. And I'll begin with just a few of the initial slides now so you can see them. And then I'll be skipping ahead to one of the main sections just so we can get into the, um, the heart of the debate. So let me just share these, these slides. Okay. All right. And I'll be going through this and basically discussing uh, each point. This first slide, which I will not replay this part of the debate, was really just to give everyone a framework that I was working in as I was discussing the various components. 
Uh, obviously, I started out with a lot of the preparatory information, like what is biblical bonitarianism. I'll skip that. That was done pretty clearly and pretty straightforwardly. Uh, then I actually get into what are the primary claims and implications. And that's where I spend really the most of the time. And then afterwards, I give some of the summary of support for this. Um, and I barely touch on John 14, 18 to 24, which we'll do this time around. I actually get, we'll take some time. We'll actually take two sections to go through John chapter 14, 18 to 24. And we'll even get into some of the responses from Trinitarians. Uh, I said during the debate at the end of this first slide, I said, hey, may we, may we all have discerning ears, thoughtful minds, and prayerful hearts, and, you know, prayerful hearts before God in Christ. And that's still the same attitude that we should approach this, even though this is informal. You know, I pray that you also have discerning ears and thoughtful minds and, and prayerful hearts. One of the things that I, um, I always put in any of the material that we do is a disclaimer, and I'll include this in this one as well, that biblical bonitarianism is unorthodox and non-credal. And that means that you should exercise a heightened sense of discernment as you engage the content, even in this video and on this channel. And hopefully that's something that um, only aids you as you start to hear the things that we discuss, okay? I'll skip through a number of these things. They're, they're, they're great points, but I think they're clear enough in the in the intro that we don't need to go back through. And they really set the stage for bonitarianism, our assumptions, and some of our main points. Okay, this, in my opinion, is the the primary slide. This is the slide in which the five main arguments are made, and I put them in question forms. Uh, I I like to think through things using questions because that helps me to clarify and make sure I'm asking the right um, information from the passage. And so there are five questions. This will be really what we'll be coming back to time and time again, just to um, square ourselves up. And what we'll be doing today is really we'll be focusing on that first question and going through an overview of that. And I'm hoping that this will give you, give everyone at least a, a grounding on the overall direction of what the debate was about. So with that said, let me actually begin by playing a little bit of the audio that goes along with this. And like I said, I'll be skipping ahead. This is around section, uh, I think the 11 minute mark and about 50 seconds in. So let me just play this and hopefully it sounds um, loud enough. And there's a later part where I'll come back You know, I'll let this play. There's a later part where I'll come back and I'll do a little bit more detail. But let's just let this play first. Okay. Here are the primary claims. Let's listen to it. I put these in the forms of questions so that you can think through what it is that we're actually claiming. And I try to make them very succinct so that you can see the actual claims. These claims are important because I'm saying that the text clearly asserts them and that they're easy to demonstrate. You can find them clearly asserted or clearly assumed, meaning they're inescapable. Let's go through these five first. What is the overarching focus of John 14 to 17? I can't go through every single verse of this section, but I wanted to at least give the background in a higher level context because this is important when someone is making a claim about what a passage teaches or an extended section of scripture is does that particular passage cohere to what they're saying? So I, I wrote this. First in this passage, the Lord Jesus Christ is addressing the disciples' problem. The disciples have a problem. They may not know it yet, but it's starting to dawn on them a great problem. What's that problem? It's the sorrow of separation from the Lord and suffering in the world that's coming. I won't read all of these verses, but Jesus throughout this passage refers to them being troubled in spirit. He said, because I've spoken these things to you, sorrow has filled your heart. And he repeatedly comes back to that theme of sorrow. But not just sorrow, suffering. He tells them very pointedly in this passage, they will suffer and they will experience the hostility and hatred of the world because of their association with him. So because they're separated from him, they will be sorrowful. And because of their association with him, they will suffer. That's the primary problem that Jesus is addressing in John chapter 14 through 17. Then he gives a promise to address this. The okay, I'll pause right there. Um I will come back and we'll elaborate more on this. For me, whenever someone is, is talking about a passage of scripture or when someone is, is addressing a, um, a uh, particular text, one of the main things that I'm very much 
curious about is, does the person have a good grasp of the entire context? Are they just taking this verse out of context? Are they making a claim about a particular text out of context? Or are they, do they have a really strong grasp of the context? And, and I would even add of the wider context, plural, of the Gospel of John, the different sections of the Gospel of John. And so for me, it was very important in this debate to first pause and say, let's first make sure we understand what this passage is about. John chapter 14 to 17, to some degree also John chapter 13. The Lord is departing, returning back to the Father, and he is preparing his disciples for sorrow and for suffering. And you see these themes in a weave. We'll talk about it more in a few more minutes. But once you have that in mind, then the promises of the Lord become much clearer in terms of what he's promising to do to his disciples in light of their predicament. Okay. Now, let me just go back to the audio. Okay, let's go. The Lord's promise, and this is very important, and hear me very clearly. This is our point. The promise that the Lord makes is that the Father will be dwelling in the Son, and the son dwelling in his disciples. One of the big problems that, that Bonitarian has, Bonitarianism has is that a lot of what we believe is very simple. It's one of our strengths, but it's also one of the challenges. Because when we say it, we say, that's it. And we say, that's it. That's the point. The father will be dwelling in the son, and the son will be dwelling in the disciples. We'll get to all the implications of what that means. But that is, at its core, the promise that Jesus is making to address the problem of the disciples. What's the ultimate purpose that he... Let me just pause here. So the way I'm framing it is, I'm just looking at an overarching focus of John 14 to 17. So first, I say the disciples' problem. Sorrow of separation from the Lord and suffering in the world. And we'll talk more about the verses that support that. And I think these are almost without controversy. This is basic you know, interpretation of a passage, I think everyone would agree when they come to this passage. But the Lord's promise, and this is really, as I said then, and I'll say now, this is really the key statement of the whole debate, that in light of their problem, the separation from the Lord and the sorrow due to suffering in the world, that the Lord is giving them a great promise to address this issue. And he's very direct in terms of what it'll be. And we'll see that when we get into the, the later sections. But our claim as Bonitarians is this, is that the Lord is claiming this. He's claiming to, he's promising them that the father will be dwelling in the son and that the son will be dwelling in the disciples. And you probably heard of say many times when we make a statement on what we believe, we'll say, that's it. Uh, I'll tell you a little bit of history that came, that how, how that came about is for, Many times I've had opportunities to share with other folks what we believe. And I remember one time in particular in sharing with someone and I explained what we believe and, you know, gave a similar type of discussion. It wasn't on John 14, but on another point. And, um, and I, I made the claim and the person said, they actually asked us a question. They said, that's it. And uh, almost in disbelief, like, you know, there's got to be more. And I said, no, that's it. <laughs> And so uh, it's become almost a, uh, a common phrase that we use after we explain something. We say, that's it. I think people are accustomed to hearing quite a bit of theology, especially if you're coming from Trinitarianism or really some forms of Unitarianism. There's a lot of uh, complexity that goes along with it. But very often, our points are very simple. And as I stated, uh, it could be a strength. It could also be a weakness because people in hearing it, they just hear it and say, okay, that's it. <laughs> and you're like, that's it. And uh, they may be waiting or anticipating more, but you say, no, that, that's it. That's the simplicity of what we're actually saying. And so I hope that, um, you know, as you go through this, all the other words, all the other verses, all the other support is really to support that claim. The Lord's promise is the father's indwelling the son and the son indwelling the disciples. That's it. Uh, I put a little point here about the ultimate purpose. Let's listen to that. Let me just edge it back a little bit. Okay. So one of the challenges, because when we say it, we say, that's it. And we say, that's it. That's the point. The father will be dwelling in the son and the son will be dwelling in the disciples. We'll get to all the implications of what that means. But that 
is at its core the promise that Jesus is making to address the problem of the disciples. What's the ultimate purpose that he alludes to? Well, he tells us directly. It's the mutual glorification of the Father and the Son in the disciples. Jesus always aiming at the glorification of the Father in everything he does from the first chapter of John to the 21st chapter of John. But what's more we find is that the Father is also mutually glorifying the Son. And as such, what we find is what we find is that even this work that Jesus is doing is for a greater purpose, that of the glorification, the mutual glorification of the Father and the Son in the disciples. Let me keep going with the summary. What else? Okay, let's not keep going with the summary. <laughs> uh, once again, great points. This is all good stuff. And um, I'm always excited when I re-listen to myself and say, okay, that was a good, you know, that was a good uh, argumentation, even though the debate was just sprawling and very long. And uh, we covered every topic under the sun. Um, I, I, when I listened to that, I said, we hit now, those points are, are solid. And that's really meant to show you the sound foundation of biblical bonitarianism. That point about the ultimate purpose, when Jesus makes the promise, He's obviously doing this to comfort his disciples, but we should never lose sight of the fact that the father and the son are doing everything to glorify each other. And we'll talk more about that when we get into some of the deep in-depth uh, verses that I use to support this. But just at the overview, I want to just replay that so you can hear those, how those three go together. The disciples' problem, the Lord's promise, and the ultimate purpose of him doing this work. I've often felt that a lot of modern Christianity puts too much focus on the believers. And that may almost sound counterintuitive that Christianity is about Christians. And I always say Christianity is not about Christians. Christianity is about Christ. And I've often said when you get to the New Testament, you find that it's a very Christ-centered, Christocentric book. It's God-oriented, but it's definitely Christocentric. Jesus is really front and center. And the father is doing everything to draw focus and attention to him. And we see this very clearly laid out in the gospel of John, even though Jesus is, you know, not seeking his own glory, especially in the earlier chapters of the, of the gospel of John, he's seeking the glory of him who sent him. But because he does what he does so well in obedience and in love to the father, talk about love based obedience, the father is going to honor him. And uh, that's now and, you know, forever. And in the gospel, we see that Jesus is, in, is very confident the Father is going to honor him. And that whole reciprocal love is just amazing. And I, I just want to pause and say something. Very often we talk theology, we do debates, but this is not just about factual information. This is profound insight into reality. We're basically learning through the gospel of John that all of reality rest upon a relationship. And it's a special type of relationship. It's a family relationship of a father and his son. And obviously as Bonitarians, we believe that's always been, they've always been father and son. There was no point where the son was not, or the father was not the father. The father was always the father and the son was always the son. And together they've been together. Obviously this debate is not to talk on that topic, but we definitely have a lot of passages we could go to support that. But what I wanna just draw your attention to is, that's just profound, that reality rests upon a relationship of love. They created the world, they did those things, and obviously we know before the foundation of the world, they, they had those people in mind who would be in Christ, but don't never view Christianity as all about us. You know, there's a common saying, it's not about you. Christianity is not about you. Ultimately, it's about the father and the son, and really it's the son seeking to glorify his father and then the father seeking to glorify his son because the son glorified the father. And the son wants that glory from the father so that he can glorify the, uh, the father with it. And there's just this beautiful mutual glorification that they have. They love each other. And, and, and the, the son is willing to take a humble role because he loves the father so much. And you can learn a lot about your relationship with the father and even with the Lord Jesus Christ from how the son relates to the father and his way of just delighting and doing things for his glory. And that's the ultimate purpose. And hopefully as we go through, you'll start to see those themes um, interwoven throughout. So in the next section, what we'll be doing is we'll be moving forward into the review of the debate. 
and we will be discussing in particular what is a paracletop. Thank you for watching and enjoy.